digital world, I saw Doolittle. <laughs> oh my god. Alright, let's unpack this. Welcome everyone once again to another Spliced In Later movie review. Movie reviews are coming fast and quick for you now that we've started a new year. My podcast is officially up and running around the time that movies are officially coming out. So I'm getting off to the cinema more and more to see all the movies I want to see. And if I decide early on that I want to see a movie, regardless of what the reviews are telling me, I stick to my guns and I see that movie. I wanted to see Doolittle from the moment it was announced several years ago. I've waited for it to come out. I've watched the release dates be moved all round. I've seen the actors come and go. And here we are. Now, let's jump right into this review because I decided to see Bad Boys for Life before the weekend. So I know this isn't an urgent listen to this review before you see the movie. If you wanted to see Doolittle, you saw it on the weekend. And unfortunately, this review cannot go back in time and change that opinion. But perhaps if you've saved Doolittle for this weekend, you can decide if it's actually worth the trip or not. As we've said in the past, this is a positive channel. I don't hate movies. Very few movies. Some movies perplex me, mind boggle me, confuse me. But not a lot of movies I outright hate. So this is going to be, as much as I can be, an objective review of the Doolittle movie and what I thought about it. I think you can probably tell by how I've introduced this episode how the review is going to go, but you might be surprised. So listen on, because it's Doolittle time. My engagement with Dr. Doolittle as a franchise is very limited. I know that it's based on books that came out many, many, many years ago. I know there was a movie that came out many, many, many years ago. My main engagement with the Dr. Doolittle franchise is simply the Eddie Murphy movies. And boy, are they good movies. Eddie Murphy is an absolute delight in most of his movies. Even the movies that people suggest are terrible, I have fun with. But those early movies where Eddie Murphy plays Dr. John Doolittle, a doctor who suddenly finds he can speak to animals, is one of those treats of the 90s and 2000 movies that you just don't really get nowadays. It's simple family fun. Most of the animals that Doolittle engages with in those older movies were real life, which is impressive. I'm sure there's animatronics in there somewhere. I doubt they got actual trained rats to engage with Dr. Doolittle, but you never know. I haven't gone back to have a look. I'm probably not going to look too much into it. For now, I'll just say the movie looks impressive. It still holds up, mostly to this day, especially the first one. The first Dr. Doolittle is just simple family fun, with the main moral being to not be a jerk, to engage with your family, to embrace that inner youth, to not let growing up ruin your imagination and your free spirit. Classic family film. Dr. Doolittle 1, back in the day, was completely made great for me by Eddie Murphy's performance. He put a lot of his Eddie Murphy comedy into it, and I enjoyed the personalities that all the different animals had that he interacted with, because you had Norm MacDonald as his dog Lucky, Chris Rock as the hamster guinea pig thing, and Albert Brooks as a tiger that's got something seriously wrong with it. So we gotta help that tiger before it dies. So yeah, I don't know how much Dr. Doolittle with Eddie Murphy is resonant to the old books and the old movies. I don't think it is that much. I think it's taken the simple premise of talking to animals and done its own thing with it. But those are the movies that encouraged me to go see this Doolittle. Specifically Dr. Doolittle 2 as well. I saw that in the cinemas, one of my first viewings in the cinema as a young child. I went without parents as well, so I went with a friend. I had not seen Dr. Doolittle 1, one of the rare times you see the sequel before you see the original movie. And that won me over too. There was a lot of good comedy involving trying to get a bear to have sex with another bear. Hey, here's a fun fact. In Australia, Dr. Doolittle 2 is rated mature audiences. It's a family film. I don't know why it's believed that people over 15 are the target audience for this movie. Maybe it's to do of all the fart jokes, I'm not sure. But Doolittle, that just came out, is rated PG and there's fart jokes in there. So who can say what is determining what movies are classified what? It honestly makes no sense. But I'm not a classification expert. I'm just a guy who has a microphone and every now and then talks for a certain amount of time, hoping people out there are listening to him. If nothing else from this review, take note that I love Dr. Doolittle 1 and 2 of Eddie Murphy, and if you haven't seen them, 
check them out because they are a treat. Now, let's get down to Doolittle 2020, starring Robert Downey Jr. First thing I want to get off immediately is that this movie is not the worst thing in the world. It is no Holmes and Watson. It's no Paul Blart Mall Cop 2. It's not one of those movies that is offensive to the eyes and makes you pray for death. But you wouldn't know it looking at all the reviews out there. Now, I had a look at the reviews before going into the movie, and I had a look at the reviews coming out of the movie, and they are ridiculous. I don't know what's going on out there. The reviews that are saying it is a affront to the very soul of a person who sees it, that their eyes needed washing out, that it's an insult to movies everywhere, that you just can't unsee what you see, is ridiculous. What an extreme and absolutely incorrect reaction to this movie. As I said before, that kind of response is to a movie like Holmes and Watson that came out a couple years ago, or Paul Blart Mall Cop 2, because the story and type of humour that is in those movies are bare-boned, they're basic gags involving flatulence, making fun of fat people, stupid people, screaming, yelling, smacking people on the head, slapstick humor, that sort of thing. Those type of movies are made simply to go for the cheap laughs, the downside being that we don't play up any sort of story or character development or emotion. Now, for those people that like movies like that, there's nothing wrong with that at all. For me personally, as a spliced in later, if I were to describe movies though that were an insult to me, unfortunately those would be the type of movies that I would go for. But I'm not about to sit here and say, haha, my opinion is right, those people should feel ashamed. You should absolutely not feel ashamed. And that's what I really want to make sure as I talk about this movie that we don't go too far into it. Because this is the prime example of what I'm always trying to hammer home. It's just the negativity extremeness that is out there at the moment. This movie is getting shredded in every aspect, in ridiculous ways. This movie needs to be put back in a box and taken back down to hell where it belongs. What are you talking about? It's a movie made for kids involving a goofy man talking to animals. And from what I saw of this movie, it set out to do that and it achieved it. If you go into this movie and you don't expect that to happen, my friends, you have gone into the wrong movie. That's on you. That's not on them at all. Their intentions are made clear from the trailers because everyone's made fun of the trailers and how they've looked. The intention's been made clear when it's been released. It has been released in January. January is notoriously when movies are released that aren't expected to be huge box office winners or critically acclaimed movies. Do not go to a movie released in January with your nose held high and your opinions going, oh, I'm ready for a, a new Blade Runner or a The Revenant or a Marriage Story. Something that's going to make me cry with emotion and tell of my friends. You're probably not going to get that in January. And also, you're probably not going to get that going into a movie about a man who talks to animals. Alright? There is one huge flaw in this movie. It is the flaw that I've come away with that I've decided is why people probably don't need to see this movie. Should probably avoid this movie. But it is not an insult. It is not a travesty. It is not something that I need to go and scrape my eyeballs at because I've been scarred forever. Doolittle's big flaw is simply that it is boring. The plot of the film is very clear. Dr. Doolittle works with animals. He suffered a tragedy, so he's become a recluse. For a series of events involving the Queen of England and an apprentice that somehow finds his way to his house, Dr. Doolittle has to go on a voyage to find something that will help him cure what ails the Queen, essentially. This mystical being that only he believes in. So he goes off looking for it in his little boat with his most faithful animals, the animals that he has befriended, hasn't quite cured them of their big issues, a polar bear that's always cold, a gorilla that's scared, a duck that can't fly, I think was its issue, can't really recall, doesn't really matter. That's it, that's the basicness of this film. Now it's not really a long running movie, it is only 102 minutes, but the issue with this film is that it does feel like a two and a half hour film. Everything is very slow. The action is inconsistent. The jokes don't always land. And when they do, they're not really that funny to get you laughing along with it. There are some jokes in here that are accidentally funny. So that was a highlight for me. There's one joke that had me laughing 
for about 10 minutes. And I'm absolutely sure the people who made this film didn't intend for me to laugh at it that long. But it was so unexpected and so absurdly stupid that I couldn't help laughing at it. But no, you watch this movie and you know where they're going to go and you know what they need to do. The problem is you know, having seen a million movies like this before, you know the steps of how it's going to get to that final point. So you just get bored waiting for them to catch up to what your brain has already figured out is going to happen in this movie. Now being boring is not an insult. It is not an affront to movies everywhere. It is not a great travesty. Lots of movies are boring. I watched a movie once that was three hours long. That gets boring. I watched a movie that was 43 minutes long once and I got bored. It all depends on the content and if you are interested in it. In terms of the acting in this movie, that is also a little bit of what lets it down. Robert Downey Jr. as Dr. Doolittle, he, for his credit, is putting a lot of effort into the role. He's putting all his energy and jumping around and giving out his lines and he's engaging with these CGI animals in a very convincing way. Its only issue is that, for some reason or another that I cannot understand, Robert Downey Jr. decided to do a Welsh accent for this movie, but he can't do a Welsh accent, or at least he decided he wants to do a cartoon Welsh accent, not a real Welsh accent. Which really drew away from his performance, because you had to wonder, why, why, why are you talking like that? I don't understand. The animals are very interesting in terms of the actors who voice them, but at a point it just became me trying to guess which celebrity was voicing which animal. I don't want to play a game where it's guess which celebrity voiced this animal. I want to get lost in the animal's performance and their emotion and their character. I don't want to look at a dog and go, that's Tom Holland. I want to look at the dog and go, I feel for you, buddy, and your need to protect the queen. One does stand out. Jason Manzukis plays a, a fly, a dragonfly. Whether it's just because I like the sound of Jason Manzukit's voice or his energy that he always brings to his characters, he was the funniest part of the movie. That said, it's never explained why he's in the movie or what his connection to Dr. Doolittle is. And just as soon as he's there, he's gone, and then he's back again. So it's decisions like that in terms of directing and story progression that you think there may have been five or six different people working on this script. And unfortunately, it shows. That said, there is some good acting in here. Michael Sheen is quite good as the villain. He is a very mustache twirling, very aware of himself villain. He fulfills the need of pushing Doolittle and co on the journey that they need to do to complete the thing to end the movie. But he seems to be having fun with it. He's aware of how cheesy the movie is and how hammy his role is, and he pushes it up as much as he can. An actor who's that self-aware and still manages to have fun with the role and entertain you top marks. Michael Sheen, well done. There's also a surprise cameo. I don't know if it's cameo because their name is plastered next to Robert Downey Jr. on the poster. I didn't see it going in, so I was delightfully surprised to see this person. So I won't spoil it on this podcast for you. But suffice it to say, this actor is always fun when he engages in these sorts of silly movies. He knows it's silly. He acts silly. He has fun being silly. And that's entertaining. Overall, there really isn't too much to say about Doolittle. It is a movie that came out in January. It took a long time to come out, and it will probably just as easily be forgotten. The only reason I went and saw Doolittle was because it was on my list to see. But as we got closer to today, I realized I have to see it for myself, because I had to understand that these reviews about it were true, and I have to tell you, they are not. If you see a review that says Doolittle is an abomination to the TV industry, that it leaves you wanting to take your brain and smash it with a rock because you want to forget what you've seen, Silly. Ridiculous. I often wonder if people have seen this movie or if they're just working off what other people have said just to contribute to the reviews. Who can say? This movie is not an insult. It is not an abomination. It is simply boring. However, I think if you are looking for a movie to take your kids to, this will do it. There were a couple of kids in my session. They laughed at the stuff I didn't laugh at. They thought the animals were cute. They had fun with Doolittle's wacky antics and his strange voice. They'll have fun. And look, they're the target audience. So mission accomplished, I guess, in my opinion. Doolittle's final review for me. The lowest I've ever given, 4 out of 10. Now I had some talks about Bad Boys for Life last week because I gave it 6 out of 10. People told, asked me if I wasn't a fan of Bad Boys for Life. If it's 5 or higher in my rating system, 5 or up means it is good. Depending on how high up from 5 it is, is whether it's great or memorable or 
truly spectacular. But if you score above five, I do not regret seeing the movie. I had fun seeing the movie, and I will watch the movie again when I get another chance. If you score below five, that doesn't say I hate you, but I have no desire to watch you again. And unfortunately, Doolittle falls into that category. I don't want to be that bored again. <laughs> so we'd have to give it a miss. So sorry, Doolittle, four out of 10. But I'm glad I went to make that decision for myself. So if you're curious, go and have a look. You might like it, who knows? Every movie is like Schrodinger's cat. You either like or you dislike it, but you don't know until you see it for yourself. Don't let other people tell you whether you'll like something or not. Make that decision for yourself. That said, if you chose to not see Doolittle this weekend, you might be doing the right thing. Who can say? It's hard to give one of these reviews where I'm not gushing over or giving more positive. It's a fine line I'm walking, and I'm hoping I'm walking it fairly without being too negative or positive. I think, if I'm being truly honest, I'm all over the place. But welcome to Spliced In Later. That's what we do here. There you are. Thank you for listening to my do little review. I'm trying to decide what next week's episode will be. It's an end of the month. I'd like to do something special, but I'm not sure what it is yet. I'll have a think. Tune in Tuesday to have a listen, see what I've come up with. I reckon it'll be good. Most of these episodes I'm very proud of, so whatever I come up with, I'll put my heart into it, and we should have a good time. But keep an eye out on this podcast. February's looming. A couple of movies are coming. Can't wait to review. Reviews are fun. I like giving my ratings. I like explaining why I like a movie. I like explaining what movie things perplexed me. And as we get further into 2020, the movie's just going to come fast and thick. So stick around. There's going to be a lot of content coming your way. Thank you very much for listening. As always, I love and appreciate every single one of you. If you are listening on YouTube, feel free to subscribe. Feel free to leave a comment. If you're listening on Spotify, you can't do that. But thank you for listening anyway. You've been spliced in later. Adios, muchachos. I'll catch you next time.